tell us about the alter ego, the uh, uh, the, reverend. the reverend. I had a friend of mine who I used to play in a band with, and he is uh, he had a gig. Someone asked him to play a series of private events at this like Italian castle, like literally <laughs> an Italian castle in Northern Italy. I was like jumping around, jumping up on tables, and I was just like sort of having this like this uh, possessed moment. Okay. And so after the gigs, these Italians would go El Reverendo, El Reverendo. And I'm like, what the fuck are they saying? And he's like, they're calling you the Reverend. That's how I'm correct. the fucking Reverend yeah, now. Man. That's what he I'm told the, the band. Yes. I'm the Reverend yeah, now. That's so who I am. <laughs> Welcome to Iman Amongst Men, presented by Shea Moisture Men. I am your host, Iman Shumper, here with my big brother, Ari. Ari, gonna say what's up to the people. What's up, people? My name is Ari, and today we got author, artist, and all-around renaissance man, Sean Amos. What's going on, bro? How are you? Thanks for having you? me. No problem. I, I know man. I was getting two for one. Oh, yeah, he's a, he's a very he's a very introduction. He loves introduction. <laughs> yeah, I like the introduction. He's yeah, see, he, he knows. Yeah, he yeah. knows. Before we get into the episode, um, I want to shout out the amazing sponsor, Shea Moisture Men. <laughs> you know, Ari and I take our personal grooming very serious, as you can see, uh, with my big brother being my barber and uh, me just being handsome and, you know, it, making it easy for him to do his job. So and an idiot. I appreciate what y'all are adding to the vibe. Uh, go out there and get yours. Yeah, man. Shea Moisture Men is designed for unique needs, lifestyles, and routines for black and brown men. People yeah. like you and me. You know? And you, Sean. Yeah. Hey, that's us. And what else they got? Um, Everything you need. Shampoos, conditioners, uh, beard butter, beard oil. Oh, yeah. Let's keep it dark and handsome, man. Um, yeah. Well, you gotta, put, keep you gotta put something in there, man. Huh? Well, I put something yeah. in my beard right now? Yeah. The theme of today's show is... A jack of all trades. Uh, hmm. Of course, me being uh, you know, a guy that likes to dabble in a little bit of everything, I kind of know the vibe and am uh, appreciative of your story as far as dabbling in a lot of different things. Thank you, man. Um, you got an incredible story. Um, you started off as a screenwriter, right? Yeah, I guess so. You guess so. <laughs> I forgot about that. I, <laughs> so long. Yeah, since I've done yeah, other I great do things. I do that. I do that. When people ask me about Dancing with the Stars, I do that. I tweak out. I'm just trying to, because you, you want to be present, right? So it's sort of like, I, I saw this uh, documentary yesterday, it's Gabby like Giffords, what I got now. and she showed up after the thing, and all things like, don't look back, don't look back, don't look back. Yeah. Just keep looking forward. You got to get and, to the next I, thing. Yeah, and I realized, I, I, don't, I don't look back mm. a lot. But yes, so I, I went to film school, and I, and I, <laughs> and I, and I, <laughs> I didn't want you, and I wrote screenplays out here in LA. For or, while, yeah. Do you remember your, your first... Whatever you wrote that you were proud of? Well, the first thing I wrote you were proud of uh, was when I was a kid. I, I wrote this uh, song that was a parody off of, uh, there's an old Billy Joel song, uh, It's Still Rock and Roll to Me. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this parody called Still a Valari to Me. Valari is like this <laughs> 70s car, and like Ricardo Montalban. Was yeah. Like this, 70s, you know, this show called Fantasy Island. Oh, so you played <laughs> off it. <laughs> it, was, it was like a parody song. It was like a weird Al Yankovic mm -hmm. song. Before, like something before that, something that, something that would have been on YouTube. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I, I was like a kid. That was the first time I was I like, wow, that's actually, it's all right. You was before your time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was making <laughs> chocolate rain before chocolate rain. So where the, where the uh, transition, <laughs> what's the transition in the music business? Where did that come from? So I went to film school and then I worked in films out here and I, just, I got like, um, it takes so damn long to get a film made. And it yeah. takes so many people and there's so many variables. And I, and I, I'm like a recovering control freak, you know? <laughs> and so I just, um, and I wrote screenplays and then you write this thing and that's not the thing that everyone's like excited about. You know, you don't sit home and like read a screenplay. At least most people don't. Not you gotta get into a film. So you, you know, I'd spend like months writing something and whether or not it got made <clears throat> was up to all these forces, like completely out of my control. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't live my life like this. This is no way. And so music, which I'd been around my whole life. My dad was an agent at the William Morris Agency. He was like the first black agent in the business. Okay, shout out and, to that. First black agent in the business. And he was a manager. My mom was a nightclub singer. And so I, mean, I grew up around music, you know, but f didn't think about playing it. And I realized, well, that's kind of, when you do music, you're your own writer, you're your own director. I mean, it's all contained. I can mm -hmm. like write a song in the morning 
you know, record it in the afternoon and play it live that night if I wanted to, right? right. I mean, it's like the whole process is super condensed and I'm in control of nearly all of it. I'm like, you know, sign me up for that. Right. And then so I just, it was like, how can I just, it was like immediacy. How can I get as much shit done you right know, now? As, as possible right now? You know, and how can I be in control of as many pieces of it as possible? Damn. Um, and so that was sort of what got me out of the film thing because it was, it was just too many, it was too much. That's crazy. That's a very honest uh, interpretation of yourself. Am, mm -hmm. I, am I a, a recovering control freak? No, you're just a control freak. <laughs> you ain't recovered yet. If you got to ask that, you ain't recovered, right? Yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> There's no I'm recovery saying, happening. I'm saying, no, for real though, that's, do you think I do music because I can control the whole shit? I think I might do I that. Know. That's weird as hell. When that's he was saying that, I was you like, can answer, damn. Sir. I was like, maybe that's why I ain't writing no films and I don't want to write no books and shit because I really would have to get that to somebody else. They got to. Well, books is even more control, but that's a whole different trip. Oh, it's more control than books. I mean, total control in that sense, but it's super solitary. I would think that a book would have to get passed around a little bit. That's much. Mm -hmm. not, not my experience, at least. Oh, so you encourage that? Because I ain't going to lie, I just, I, I resonated with what you just said about the control mm -hmm. of music. I've always felt like that. Like, I can tell you exactly how it's supposed to sound. I could write it, but it does cut that process down yeah. when I'm able to record it. Somebody's able to mix it for me or I can mix it myself. Like, and I have that time because I'm like, it'll be a masterpiece by the end of the day. Like, I don't have to wait that time right. for y'all to yeah. understand it's, how good it's it is. fully your expression yeah it's like this it's like is by who... the time i press press play you got it yep like you'll get it now or, or you don't get it and then i know i can make another song Wait, so it was out in response to to sports where because you too much out of, your, out of your control there i don't know man you might need to be my therapist who show it yeah. <laughs> who show is it yeah, keeping it on the perspective of, uh, like you said, your your parents uh, were in the music business. Your dad was a um, agent, and your yeah. mom was a nightclub singer. What did you learn from them, like overall, when you decided to get into entertainment, or were there any lessons that you learned from them oh that my you God. use? Those lessons, the lessons keep unfolding. Yeah. Give me a lesson with a story, though. Mm, a good story. Yeah, give me something. I mean, I think from most of it's like it's just about hustle. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my my. I think my, I learned more about the business and what it takes to, you know, make it in anything, you mm -hmm. know, from my father because he was just the ultimate hustler mm -hmm. and, and just grounded out, man. Yeah, he was I mean, hustling dashiki. What? <laughs> hustling in the dashiki. His dashiki is in the Smithsonian Institute now, that, that, that shirt he wore. Oh. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, just, I followed him around everywhere, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. like, my parents were divorced and, you know, my dad wanted to hustle. And so if it was my turn to stay with him, he wasn't going to like take me to Disneyland or like the park. He's like, okay, you're coming with me to like the soundstage or yeah. to the recording studio or to the nightclub or whatever. So I, I just was always with, with him while he did his thing. Right. And, I'm, and I got sat, you know, put in the corner over there and you sit there while I go do whatever. So there's it's a lot of observation, you know, not only of him, but of all these other people who are around. And so I just, and, and, and then all the red carpet shit, you know, I wasn't there for it because I was like off limits for a little yeah. kid. So I just saw the work being done. Yeah. And I never saw like the glitz part of it. I just saw people doing the work, like a take over and over and over again, or, you know, the spending an hour trying to get the lighting right or whatever it was. So for me, the lesson was like, oh, wow, this stuff is like, it's a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a job like any other job. How does that shape you going forward as a kid? Did you always feel like you were? older than everybody you hung out with? Yeah, I thought I was writing the book, man, because like in, in the book, the kid is, Ellis is 11, or, or, or 11, yeah, 11. And in reality, I was seven when I worked at my dad's cookie store. Uh -huh. And so I have to like check myself and think, was I really that young? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like doing the math, you know, my <laughs> right. because I can't, it's hard for me to believe like I was that young doing the things yeah, I was Second grade doing. working the register. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Standing on milk crates, doing the thing, right? And so I was all, I've been, I've been working for a long time, you know? And it was just, you work. You know, you work. That's and, that blue uh, collar it, shit, man. That's not even blue collar. That's just illegal. What you mean? <laughs> yeah. You're having a seven-year-old work every the shop. child labor law. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's just illegal. That's like, wrong, that's, though. 
No, it's dope. He's he learning to do math it. way better than somebody that's. Yeah, do you school? think like skills like that came along to you or did skills like that, like math and arithmetic and all that, totally. did that come along to you yeah, I still remember, of- man, the first time I gave change to somebody, I can't remember the exact amount, but I remember they, it was like, you know, $5 and 28 cents and they gave me like $5 and like, you know, 30 cents. They, they were rounding up to, mm-hmm. so they wouldn't have to get back pennies or whatever the fuck. And I, I couldn't like, I know what they were doing. And so the customer explained to me like why they'd given me like this sort of well, odd uh-huh. you know, amount of change because they, you know. mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I, mean, I was, it, is, it was like that's where the world was back then, right? I mean, people were sort of like engaging with right. kids in a different way you mm-hmm. know, um, than they do now. I never thought about that. But yeah, yeah. I, was, I was learning it's these like these you lessons. wouldn't even trust a kid to, I wouldn't trust <laughs> my, my kid to go <laughs> on the other side of the I street. I mean, unless you got to go to just do something like mm-hmm. I really need her to do and she knows the level of seriousness. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't just leave my kid at the front register while I'm cooking yeah. mm-hmm. and just be cool with it. You know what I'm yeah. saying? At least not in today's day and age. You're just not saying, let me put that responsibility on a seven-year-old. Yeah, totally. And it's just crazy to think. Uh, you know, I, not even crazy to think. I, I guess I'm just interested to know, like, when you sat down in school, by the time other kids are being introduced to these numbers, are you looking at the lesson like, why are we learning? Well, I'm horrible at math, man. I mean, like, so. <laughs> for, 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 uh, there's a reason why I play music and write. <laughs> I didn't make it past, like, algebra one. <laughs> So, so don't make me out to be some hey, kind of like, like Einstein or something. No, 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 no. I, just meant, I just meant, did you feel more prepared? Like, I remember the first time I had to go pump gas. I didn't know what the fuck to do. I felt prepared for life, for sure. I mean, I, I could hang anywhere with anybody. That's what I meant. Like, like sure. did you feel like other kids are just not up to rank? Oh, yeah. Like, you yeah. had to bring everybody up. Like, dog, this is all you got to do. We go in here, we woo-woo-woo, yeah. and then we out. Yeah, and, 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 and on top of it, it's LA, right? Which is like, a segregated town, you know, and, it, and it's a town where if you've got money in LA, like real money, right. you get sheltered from a lot of stuff already, right? I mean, like, you know, a kid who's growing up in Beverly Hills isn't pumping their own gas for the most part. And then, and there's just a lot of privilege around, right? And, and I didn't have privilege. My, my dad was making his thing happen. It happened after the fact, right? But, you know, at the age I was at, while he was trying to make it happen, wasn't making it happen. I was going to school with kids whose parents were like massive entertainment lawyers or they were, you know, hugely successful, you know, families. Huh. And, and my father was creating his success like in that real time. So I was the only one who was working. <laughs> no mm-hmm. one else was working anywhere. Because right. you know, they didn't have to, need to, or their parents didn't place importance upon that or whatever it was. But I was like, Hustling, because I had a father who was a hustler. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah and so hustle, hustling begets hustling. <laughs> hustling <laughs> begets hustling, yes. He dropping jewels. Your dad founded Famous Amos Cookies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How did he create the successful part of the company? Like, how do you, how do you, because we got a lot of listeners that yeah. have great ideas, right? And they believe in them, but they don't really know how to put it on paper put it into a store and make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you should me that? realize, man, that like the other lesson I learned was like all of his mistakes and all the way he messed up. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I tell this man this all the time. I don't know if they, I, I rubbed him the wrong way when I say it. I'm the third child. I literally watched him and my older brother do stuff. And like, oh shit, we'll just make this left with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, let me duck right here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, as absolutely. far as their mistakes go, it was like everything they did. Like, bro, why are you even over here? Like, I'm just nosy in their business. <laughs> He's I'm looking just, at you. <laughs> for real, though, he used to be asking me that. Like, dog, like, get out my shit. Yeah. Like, you learn. Just loving how yeah, he's talking yeah. about our life like it's a video game. I'm just, just saying that. Wait his turn. And <laughs> he just I got it that. right because I seen all of that. Mm-hmm. I, I, my father was a, a master um, promoter, showman, marketer. Right? I mean, at a time when that wasn't, um, I mean, there's no black mm. faces of business. You know, he started the company in 75. So he had all the sort of marketing thing lined up, like tight. But he didn't run a business at all. You know, <laughs> like at That's all. That's a lot of us. Yeah. And, and so it becomes like this, that founder's dilemma, right? It's like, you know, having a good idea, knowing you have a good idea. Mm-hmm. 
believing in yourself enough to execute that idea. I think the last piece is then having the sort of humility and the courage to surround yourself around people who know the things that you don't know. Jeez. And that part's hard. Mm -hmm. that, that's the hard <laughs> part, right? And, and I think it's especially hard, frankly, for, for black men. <laughs> for sure. I, I, think it's, I think it's hard for people who come from not a lot. And so the idea of like letting go and, you know, sharing a little bit and hundred percent nothing is nothing. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe 75% of something is okay. Well, some, right? And some people yeah. just, I know people that are threatened by people who are going to take my idea. Yeah, man. And there's a paranoia and, 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 and some of it's, all of it's justified, man. Right. We, we, we got, we got a history of being ripped off. Right. 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 You know, right? I mean, our For whole sure. culture has been ripped off. Right. So I, so it comes from a real place, you know, mm -hmm. but so he wouldn't, you know, he wanted to control the whole thing and he wasn't qualified. You know what mm. I mean? He wasn't, he was qualified to market this thing. You know, he was the heart and soul of the thing, but he wasn't qualified to like figure out a balance sheet or figure out, you know, how quickly you scale something. Or something. Yeah, yeah, in my mind, the, the motherfucker was a genius. <laughs> no, 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 no. It is, there's a genius behind it, but it's still madness hey, just because it's like. The genius in the madness. I've worked with a lot of musicians as a producer and, and, and it's like, you know, that whole like stereotype. Exactly. The whole stereotype of, you know, you got like your, your, your cousin's your manager and like, you know, your third cousin is your bookkeeper and your uncle is your, blah, blah, and because and, 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 you want to keep it all with people you can trust, mm. but they're not qualified <laughs> <laughs> to do that. No, so what, what's, what's, what's worse or what's better? And, and, and that was his trip, right? And so mm. by the time this thing was like really like getting huge, he lost total control of the thing because he just, he couldn't, run it and so he, he was and he's also hiring people who weren't qualified because he felt he could either control them or you know they would listen to him in the end right they, they would stand down yeah. he, he wanted to be the guy in charge right so he hired people who just didn't know what the hell they were doing a lot of them ripped him off um he just wasn't making smart business decisions while he was making every right marketing hype decision right and so the thing just he kept getting diluted and diluted and diluted and diluted. And by the end of the thing, he, he lost he lost it. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and it's a tragedy. I mean, on, on some level, you know. I mean, and part of the book for me was I got so used to like owning that part of the story. He fucked it up, he fucking lost it, he fucking blew it. You know, I mean that 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 became like the the, the narrative for me, you know? And so people come to me, oh my God, your dad's famous, famous. What a great thing he did. And he's really loved, you know, particularly in the black community sure. it, and deservedly so. But I would like undermine that. And I'm like, uh, fuck, yeah. I, I would sort of like, I, I would sort of like diminish his story to other people, you know? And, and that wasn't fair to anybody, you know? And, and so in writing the book, I realized, wow, man, he did something tremendous. Yeah. You know, he did something tremendous. And, uh, and yeah, he couldn't hold on and blah, blah, blah. But that's the story of a lot of our mm -hmm. people, man, frankly, you know? Yeah. And, and so, um, so I have a whole new take on it now, you know what I mean? And I sort of, my respect, I think I frankly lost at some point is totally regained, you know? And I learned, like, have the courage to surround yourself around people. And right. Right. You know, they're doing you, you do. don't. Real talk. I yeah. think that's, that's beautiful for a takeaway for them. Like, you know what I'm saying? As a listener, I feel like, so much of our ideas, like we do find that one thing in that list you name that it's like we just didn't do or we didn't get to that step. And now the idea is either two years old and y'all don't want to double back mm -hmm. on it or uh, somebody did a version of that. So you need to tweak it a little yeah. bit. Uh, you realize that the name, you can't you can't own the name. You got to rethink the whole thing yeah. now. Um, yeah, do the homework, man. Yeah, you know do, what I'm saying? Do the homework. And, but I, I, I really think it's that, that thing you were saying where you have to build this infrastructure. Uh, you have to build it where you're saying, I completely trust this person on the other side. I completely trust this person over here and this person over here to do that while we do this. Yep. And just say, I'm going to be the best at this part. Yeah, for like, sure. For real. I think the only reason I'm able to do it is because I play basketball. So I'm like, I'm completely with that. Like, you know that, yeah. I know goes, my favorite part of whatever right, it is. Right, right. Like, we're going to do this. I know my favorite part. Selected. I'm going to do, yes, yeah. I'm going to do my part. You do your part. Like, and it kind of goes back to, so you're talking about the control thing, but in the end, I guess, like everything's a, a team effort on some yeah. level, right? I mean, I mean, whether it's truly a team sport mm -hmm. or whether you write a book, but you, you need, you need a publisher, you need an editor. I mean, so at some point you got to like, I think that's just from having brothers for me. Mm -hmm. I got to have somebody to celebrate with. Right, right. 
But even on Dancing with the Stars, I had a teammate. <laughs> I'm just used to a teammate. Yeah, like, give me a team. Yeah. Uh, love a good team. <laughs> Cookies and milk, guys. <laughs> Cookies and milk. I saw in another interview that you said it was therapeutic for you. Like, in what way do you think it was, like, really, other than, you know, the relationship with your pops, like, what way was it therapeutic for you to write it? Oh, it's so much. I mean, I, I wrote the, in the introduction, you know, that the book is for my son and my father. And, and and I sort of viewed the book as being a, a bridge between these three mm-hmm. you know, generations, and um, you know it, it allowed me to well, I mean, a couple of like one of them I said earlier, like I, I it, it sort of changed the narrative for mm-hmm. me of of my childhood and, and my time with my dad, where I I, I built this narrative like ah, oh, you fucked it up, and yeah, and so it, it shifted that narrative around, which is in and of itself is just super therapeutic. Mm-hmm. It, it it um it allowed me to forgive myself and him for like me for my own divorce, you know, him for his <laughs> divorce. Mm. Uh, so I, I could I could forgive us both. Um, and it sort of and it gave me um, it sort of I, I wanted to leave something for like my kids for my you know I have half siblings you know my my half my half siblings have kids. I, I wanted to leave something that they could all hold. Yeah, you because know, the company's not ours anymore. Mm-hmm. You know I mean, it, it it belongs to somebody else, and that's you know, and so, and and a lot of you know this. I mean, you know, you're you're a celebrity. When you when you when you're a celebrity, you know, part of your you kind of you lose part of your story. Yeah, you know? mm-hmm. it, it becomes part. Like everyone sort of owns a piece of you, right? Uh, to some degree, mm-hmm. and, and so, um, you know, I, I wanted something that we could claim as our. You know, like so that's a book that like. Hopefully, you know, my kids will read to their kids and on uh, and, and it's something that's owned by you know, us, mm. you know, literally and figuratively. And and that, sure. that was an, and that was therapeutic for me. I love it. What audience were you trying to really like tackle when you wrote the book? Because I know it, it seems like a children's book on the outside, but then when you open it up, yeah, some of the that, stuff in there, you like, damn. Like did, that did, did you think that? Yeah. Especially because you were so young experiencing yeah. a lot of this. I wanted a book that like dads would read, you know, because mm-hmm. I'm a dad. You mm-hmm. know, I wanted a book that like black fathers would relate to, you mm-hmm. know, as, as well as black sons. Mm-hmm. And I so I promise my dad did not want to read us half the shit. <laughs> <laughs> For real. He wouldn't put he wouldn't put the feeling into what to go like. Yeah, that. like he just he, I could tell he was just like, why do you want to read this book? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Really? Like, he, uh, he's not going to sell it to me. Like, yeah, yeah. So I'm saying it's actually comforting to hear that that's what that's for. Because I, I can remember. I, it's crazy. I could really remember my dad trying to read me stories to sleep and me telling my mom I'd rather have her read it, like, do the voice, like, do the... Like, it had to be vivid for me, yeah. Yeah. And he was saying that when he was listening to the audio version that you actually do the voices. Yeah. And that remind, like, because I remember asking my dad to do it. It's just he didn't put the feeling into it. It was just He's phoning it in. Yeah, Yeah, there you go. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah." Like, go to sleep already. Like, (laughs) (laughs) How much more for me to say? I got a game on it. He like, yo, we read this yesterday. (laughs) But I just, I remember, <laughs> I remember him uh, doing that. But I, I bet if the story was a little heavier where he felt like it was almost therapeutic for him as mm-hmm. well, that was, yeah. it's an easier thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think that's sure. a big part of a relationship mm-hmm. for a father and son, like retaining information together. Like, yeah. yeah. And then him being able to break it down to me, like that was always big for me, like being able to feel like, Y'all, he's going to basically filter information to me. Like, I'm never going to get the bad bits of it. He's going to try and give me the best positive version or the best smoothest way for me to understand it at whatever age I'm at. And he also had those moments where I'm sure you do cross some lines in the book where you just say what needs to be said. He had those those teaching moments yeah. where it was just like, son, this is just the way the world is. I was just trying to write something that was just honest, you know, mm-hmm. and, and and hope that the honesty like came through to a kid, you know, the honesty came through to a, to an adult. And there's also this period thing too, right? It's on top of it, it's like takes place in the seventies, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, how do you explain the seventies <laughs> to like, you know, a kid now, right? And make that even interesting and like relevant. So there's all these sort of like hoops I had to jump through, but you know, I, I just felt like 
I got to feel good about it. Mm. It's got to be, it's got to be honest. It's, it's got to talk straight. And, and, and if I could do that, then hopefully it'll work for a number of ages, even if it's technically meant for, you know, a middle right. grade or, or whatever. But I've got, I've had people write me, man, who are like, you know, adults and they're like, wow. It's like, you know, Love the book. this is like, I, I didn't really think about it being a kid's book while I was reading it. Right. Which That's is like the you, ultimate yeah. you know, praise, man. You kind of yeah. really forget. I even told them like before we came out here, like I was listening to the audio book right. and you doing the impressions, you kind of do them so well to where I forget that this is only you reading. Mm. Like this is only him Thanks, speaking. Man. Like even with his grandmother, the grandmother was my favorite. Yeah, it's, and now it's therapeutic too. We go to your, your earlier question, man, just to relive, mm-hmm. you know, to sort of embody, you know, my family members, right? And uh-huh. you know, my grandma's not here anymore. My dad's, you know, all but gone because he's got dementia now. Um, so like, I'm the last living witness to this stuff, right, you know. And right. then so to sort of uh, to to represent these people when they can't represent themselves anymore was was was. Uh, an honor. Hey man, we're gonna get back to the work in music because I don't wanna I don't wanna get away from the music industry conversation. Uh tell us about the alter ego, the uh, uh the, reverend. the reverend. Yeah. Talk the reverend. to me. Sean. Yeah, do reverend do he wear something different? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> not, he, not much. Actually, no, I, 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 I said a whole tour in this outfit, so yeah, this is pretty much it. Oh, they they just yeah. became the same person. They right? kind of became the same person. Okay, yeah, cool. they, they started off pretty different. <laughs> and they, they, they fused. So I um I started playing music. And I was doing like singer songwriter folky kind of thing, and I um, and then, and I was a fan of the blues, in which I was earlier, right? Mm-hmm. But but I I just didn't want to play the blues. I had a friend of mine who I used to play in a band with, and he is uh, he had a gig. Someone asked him to play a series of private events at this like Italian castle, like mm-hmm. literally an Italian castle in northern Italy, and he knew that I was like a student of this stuff. He's yeah. like, look, why don't you come over? We'll put a band together. You sing. You you can put whatever song list you want because you know this stuff and come come over and sing blues for a couple of weeks. I'm like, all right. So I went over there, and this is 2012, and I sang you know like little Walter songs and Junior Wells and Muddy Waters and all these old Howlin' Wolf, all these old blues guys from Chicago mainly. Mm. I just love that stuff. You know? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you guys are from Chicago. You should know this. Stuff. So when I started singing this stuff, man, I became like something like happened. It was like you know, I got like. Yeah, you know, the lightning bolt kind of through the head thing. Mm-hmm. And I like became this sort of like character. I was like jumping mm-hmm. around, jumping up on tables. And I was just like sort of having this like this uh, possessed moment. Oh, and after, and the Holy the, Ghost. Yeah, I got the Holy uh, Ghost, man. Yeah, okay. I, got, I, got, I literally got the Holy Ghost. Okay. And so after the gigs, these Italians would go, El Reverendo, El Reverendo. And I'm like, what the fuck are they saying? And he's like, they're calling you the Reverend. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, that's it, Getting it stamped by Italian, like, Italian Catholics. If the Italian Catholics are calling me the Reverend, that's how I'm correct. the fucking Reverend yeah. now. That's what he I'm told the, the man. Yes. I'm the Reverend yeah. now. That's so, who I am. <laughs> so I, I came back it. and I'm like, I'm the Reverend. They don't know. Yeah. That, <laughs> but they was like, who told you? Like, <laughs> who? Italy. Italy. <laughs> Italy. But I needed it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I needed it because I, I needed that sort of like separation. No, that's fine. You know what I mean? Because I, 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 I wasn't like, comfortable totally with it and i felt like and I was, it was kind of an act you know what i mean it became less of an act with every passing year so the fusion thing right but it was yeah. it was nice to like so you really be the reverend on stage be sean everyday live i could turn it on turn it off yeah keeping it on the music <laughs> we have, what were some of the uh best moments you had working behind the scenes oh man or other, one good moment lessons. uh i worked for quincy jones for uh a year. I've known Quincy since I was born because Quincy and my dad used to work together. Mm. And, um, and I produced Quincy's box set, this sort of career retrospective box back in 2000, 2000. And then he hired me to run his foundation uh, for a year, which I failed at miserably. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but he told me, he, God, he, he, he's like a genius, but you know, one, cherish your mistakes. Going back to what we talked about earlier. That, you know, Quincy told me mm-hmm. that. And uh, in this line, he tells a lot of people, but uh, leave space for God to walk in the room, which is like, That's which fun. to me is like, prepare, prepare, prepare. And talk about preparation, man, that dude prepares. I mean, he's like just, you know, leaves nothing to chance, but leaves some space for God to walk in the room. Meaning like, you, you've got to like, sort of be soft enough to expect the unexpected and roll with it. You know, so whether it's like a moment you want to take advantage of or whether something gets fucked up 
and you gotta like not let it rattle you and figure out how you still you know stay on track but you know leave space for god to walk in the room and i i love that line how did you approach being an artist differently from being an executive I, it, it's the same, man. Yeah, I think it's the same, it, which is is sort of l- leading with the courage to to let your heart sort of into the room first. Yeah. And I, I found like that's sort of the secret weapon, even more so in the executive world, because there's so much fronting in the executive business space, right? He can say that again. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and there's so much of this... Um, you know, I am what my business card says, or I am, you know, what my suit says, or I am what my bank account says, and, mm-hmm. you know, I am, you know, the size of my office, or all this kind of crap. And when you sort of approach people as just like a person, as a human, it it's kind of takes them aback a little bit in that, in that space, because everyone's sort of hiding behind, like, numbers and figures and the latest quarterly this, or blah, 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 whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. The hustle. And so... I, and, and at the same time, if you're in the studio or you're writing, I mean, you've got to like put your heart on the line because it, people see that it has, has no, almost has no value. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why people are no coming feeling. To you, they're coming to you for that. Yeah, right? They're coming they, to you for, for you to be, I say all the time that people are like, uh, looking for you to be a superhero of their problem. Like, yeah. They've never really seen somebody actually turn and fight it. <laughs> yeah, the thing <laughs> they be can't honest. be, right? Or, I mean, or, they could say be, they lost, or say that they lost to it and they don't want to tell anybody about it and you just became the spokesperson yeah. for them. So mm-hmm. they're like, I'm going to sing along because he's crazy, but I ain't crazy. Yeah, they want you crazy. to show the vulnerability that they you know, don't always have the courage yeah. to reveal themselves. But so in, that, so, so in both instances, if, if you're showing up with your, you know, having your sort of heart walk in the room first, that to me becomes like the collateral, mm-hmm. you know, to, to, to get things done and, and to have, have a, a meaningful um, exchange. Yeah. Well, you got them sayings, boy. Right, right. Jules. Oh, my, my soul. He got the fortune cookies hey, you know in his pocket. Sean just looking like, I, I don't know no, why you guys know me so much. I, I don't even know what I just said. Okay. No, okay. Fortune, <laughs> cookies. All right. fortune cookies in right. his, his soup jacket, man. Oh, yeah. sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then just write them. Yeah, just spin them out. <laughs> yeah. they made by people, too. Oh, Not bro, machines. None of that stuff. Exactly. Shane on the last track. Handmade fortune cookies. There you go. We talked about, like, the transitioning in the music business, like, what was it like also, speaking of you being a renaissance man, what was it like transitioning into, you know, digital marketing? There was a moment in the early, I guess, 2008, somewhere right before the crash happened. And, mm. you know, Twitter just started and Facebook was a new thing. And um, I always joked when I was in the music business and even in the film business, I was always like too late. You know, for shit. You know, I should have been in the music business like in the 70s. I should have been, you know, I was always like just showing up mm-hmm. late for stuff. My timing mm-hmm. was always just wrong. <laughs> and, and there was a moment when I just saw this content, what's now called content marketing mm-hmm. sort of come where, where like all these new platforms were coming up, right? Twitter was happening and, you know, the iPhone had just like, it was about to get launched. And I just saw this moment of like, there's going to be all these people, companies, you know, entertain, whether it be entertainment companies or businesses like Coca-Cola or whatever, and they're going to need to figure out what to do with this. Like, mm-hmm. how, how do they, what do you even do on Twitter if you're a company? What do you even do on Facebook? You know, mm-hmm. No one knew. And, and I just sort of like, that, that's a business, you know, helping people figure out how to tell their stories on these new platforms. Like Instagram wasn't happening yet. There was none of it. And so um, that's what I did. Yeah. And then so I went to Fox and, you know, I helped them like do content for mm-hmm. all their, like for American Idol and for all their sort of scripted stuff. Um, went to, you know, PepsiCo and it is, it just sort of, it was the only time in my life I was like in the right place at the right mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And so I started this content marketing company and sold it to a big agency, big publicly traded company. And the minute I got into that space, I mean, I knew almost immediately, like I didn't want to part of this i just it's just like it's just way not my scene <laughs> did, did, did. so i stuck it out and i bailed and that was that yeah i mean it was, it was just sort of it was it was a cool little moment yeah. yeah i mean but it, it's become this part of my biography but i don't like <laughs> I, don't, I don't like he's upset yeah kind of i mean I he's <laughs> just because just I, I don't um it was a cool experience but i, I don't you know i went this trip man where it's like i felt like we talked about this earlier before the show, right? It, mm-hmm. It's sort of like the fronting thing where it's sort of like, I feel like if I'm in music circles, part of me is like apologizing for like having, doing the marketing thing. <laughs> I'm doing the marketing thing. Part of me is like apologizing that I 
playing a blues band or something. I mean, it, it's to, it, it, I'm still trying to figure out how to circle like of shame integrate all that <laughs> stuff and and not and feel like sort of like it's all okay mm -hmm. to do all this shit and then I'm not just posing or something. It's crazy. <laughs> I don't never. I never thought of it like that. I always thought like I had a whacked out like childhood as far as like trying to please people mm -hmm. and then I accidentally started liking everything I was told to do. Oh wow. You know what I'm That's saying? A trip, like yeah. people are like, yo, you should stay in school, like stay in school and just play ball. Like that's all you should do. And I was like, well, I kind of like school. Like all my friends is there. If I do my homework early, I don't get my ass whooped. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like finish your homework. I could be outside all day. It's girls outside. Oh, we got bikes. I could be outside all day. I ain't tripping. Wow. Yeah. Like, that's how I would do. And I'm like, oh, y'all want to rap? Cool. We can rap. I definitely don't want my raps to sound lame. So I'm going to get my raps. I'm going to be writing all the time. So it was like, I was doing all these different things. And then oh, as you get older, people are like, you need to focus on. Yeah. And I'm like, nigga, this is focus. Like, yeah, that was my, yeah, I went, you pick a land, pick a land, pick a land, pick a But it's like, if I don't, because now it's like, for me, it was like, after I play basketball, I'm used to rapping. Like, it's like damn near my cool down. Right. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, and yeah. I start feeling like that. So I was like, with other people that do, I always wondered how it felt for them. Like, if it always felt seamless, like you're just floating. It, 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 the act of it's seamless. Like, I love, because it's all creativity. You yeah. Know? It's, it's like, I, I love it. didn't feel hard. Yeah. But I get hung up on, like, how I'm being perceived for some reason. You know, there, there, there's, there's, there's this degree of self-consciousness that I can't shake entirely. Word. That That is, like, you know, sort of, been been like the, the battle on some level yeah i think we done you know, like we just like in our household it was just hard not to have your like your manhood together like you gotta like get your like we just had a confidence to just say whatever like i could hold my ground and be like i don't give a fuck what none of y'all yeah, can I like, love that long as that, i could get to yeah. the crib and they know what i got going mm -hmm. on like they know me for real i'm like y'all yeah. don't even know eh. yeah that's how i be feeling that's, like, that's, like, that's a like defense my, mechanism that other people don't have sometimes. that's my dream <laughs> yeah like literally i got that from just that's my dream having my but like if if i know i gotta spend the whole day with them anyway like, I just got to get along with you for six hours, or I could be mad with you for six hours. Like, man, fuck that. It's four you total? There's four siblings. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it's All like, boys. bro. All boys. All boys. Yeah, like, I felt like I got my homies at home. I got my dad who finna be down my neck. <laughs> my mama, right. I'm like, bro, why do I care what y'all got going right, on, right. dude? I'm like, I... It could, maybe it's the only child thing, right, man? I'm, I'm alone. That's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, just, just know, nowhere to go but my head. I mean, I was raised by the streets. Yeah, you talked openly about your mom. Uh, suffering mental difficulties and eventually committing suicide. How did you get through that? And what were the lessons that you learned, you know, experiencing something like that? Uh, I mean, I think you're always getting through it. I mean, anyone who's lost someone like that, it, it's sort of a, you know, forever mm -hmm. wound. It, it was the culmination of like a journey. Right? So on one level is a shock. Mm -hmm. uh, and on another level, well, of course this happened, <laughs> you know, because she was just so extremely ill you know my entire life uh mm -hmm. and so you know the thing that i'm dedicated to now is you know talking about that stuff openly because there's such a secrecy and a shame around that stuff and mm -hmm. i think particularly in black families you know, it was in, i was telling you earlier i mean mm -hmm. you know i didn't know what my mother had until after she committed suicide because no one ever talked about her being sick Mm -hmm. I mean, she clearly was sick. She was hospitalized like all the time. But, oh, she's gone off. Oh, she's just nervous. So oh, you know, all these sort of euphemisms, mm -hmm. you know, talk about the fact that she had schizoaffective disorder and she was mm -hmm. completely psychotic. Yeah. And, and so everyone's just being around the bush around this stuff. And so, you know, total disservice to her, you know, total disservice to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all because of just some degree of shame or discomfort or whatever it is. So for me, the the legacy of it and the lesson of it is to talk about this stuff more openly. It's happening. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as a society, mm -hmm. we're getting a lot better about talking about mental illness, you know, more openly than we ever have before. But we still have a long way to go. Right. Uh, so that's sort of um, the thing that stays with me is how to talk about this stuff openly. It's why I do talk about it openly. Uh, and and then the other part of it is like, you know, there. I saw this friend friend of mine last night. I was staying with. It, it, there's also just a just frankly relief. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it was like okay, she's out of her pain, man. Yeah, you know? right. and I'm out of my pain, <laughs> yeah, you know, to some degree. And the, yeah, and you, as soon as you think that, you feel guilty for thinking that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's real, man. Yeah, you know, you're just like okay. Yeah, that's phew, understanding. Yeah, you know, I can I can breathe. I can sort of be free from that. She can be free from it. I'm free from it. Let me move on now because I gave up a lot of my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, just sort of having to help her and manage her her trip. Yeah. You know? You've also spoken about being a father, ups and downs with your kids. For the audience, uh, what's the lessons on fatherhood that you learned and that you passed on? I'm still trying to learn how to be a father, man. That's the main reason I wanted to come here and talk. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. You said no. Yeah. Trying to be a father. <laughs> trial and error with fatherhood, yeah, man. man. You I'm, think it's pure trial and error? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the hardest thing on earth, man. Because you still got to try your daddy shit out to see if it works. It's the hardest thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I got three kids. My oldest is 21. Mm-hmm. My youngest is 13. Ellis, who's the, you know, sort of the namesake of the book, he's 17. And, um, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, I, 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 I'm better than my father was. I know that for a fact. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I'm not as good as I'd like to be. Um, I have a desire to keep getting better. But it, it's fucking hard, man. But well, that yeah. boy off, ain't he? Yeah, yeah, man, straight shooter. I like how, yeah. yeah. I mean, don't you think? I mean, yeah. are you for your father, aren't you? Yeah, we're both. I got two. Yeah, you got two. How many kids you have? Two. Two. How yeah. old are you? Um, one is fifteen. The other is three. And yours? Six, about to be seven, and one about to be two. So, and you guys should probably be off. I mean, like your your parents are still together. I mean, and whether I mean whether they've got. A oh girl. no, I struggle. I struggle. <laughs> I struggle. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah, not as much as you, but right. I struggle. Not as much as you. You're yeah, fucked yeah. up. Because <laughs> <laughs> you clearly <laughs> got some shit to work. Get it together, Sean. Get it together, uh, man. Uh, yeah, I got to. I'm still figuring it out, too. I think me and my wife, we're, we're very honest with that, that we don't. Sometimes we really don't know what the fuck we're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I can you. I mean, there's no rule book for it. But, At all. Know, it's a desire to do but it. I'm saying I just know the feeling of saying, like, I'm still figuring it out. Yeah. Like, I'm still trying to get stuff right. I'm still missing cues and, you know, missing more. Like, all the moments that you want to coin, it's like, it's only with your own kids that you could really be real to yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, nah, I could have been there for yeah. that. Yeah. Or I could have handled this like this. Like, you may not say it out loud, but you it play in your head when it's your kid. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, for sure. Uh, the 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 honesty to to step forward and say, nah, I, I definitely need to keep improving and keep getting better and keep trying to be better for my kids and keep trying to. Because people say all the time, like I don't I don't even think of it as a negative when you say like, you know, I'm better than my father was. I feel like we supposed to pick no, up, I, I, pick totally. up everything I, that I your father that gave you, and then you're supposed to go further. Yeah. Like that's your job. Totally, like man. as a son. That is your duty to your father, whether yeah. your father was in your life or not. You're supposed to pick up their pieces of whatever they had because you got to see it and take yeah. it further. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Sure. Like, no matter how far you take it, you take it further. And if you don't owe your father after that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that's how I feel. That's the only way to, to correct the currency. Um, so, He's yeah. also got, you got to want to do it, too. I mean, I, I think so much, so many men, <clears throat> their father, they're, they're becoming fathers by accident, frankly, they want to be father. Or, yeah. or, or there's some autopilot about it. It's just like, well, I, I, I mm-hmm. should be a father. Mm-hmm. And you, to, to do it with intentionality, you know, and mm-hmm. to, to, like, to want to be a father, <laughs> to want to be a father. Yeah. You know, I don't think, I know my father didn't want to be a father. I mean, he just sort of stumbled into fatherhood, you know, and, 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 and I know a lot of men like that, you mm-hmm. know, frankly, who are just like, well, you know, I got kids everywhere, and I don't, you know, and it's like, but just to want to be a father. Yeah, even yeah. if you got them everywhere, man, go out there and put them all on a group chat. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Pick them all up. Let them all have your location. Like, yeah. whatever you're doing, just keep pouring into the kid. Like, people be thinking, if, like, if they broke, like, if you broke and you got to be all the way away somewhere and you got to work head down and you can't see none of your kids because they all in different states and you messed up, just be honest. And tell them why you away yeah. and constantly communicate. And you'd be surprised at yeah. how much that saved. A lot of kids just don't know what you're doing on the other side. You could literally be working to get back because you yeah, got yeah. deported. Yeah, like, be proud. Be pr- yeah. I text my kids every, you know, wherever mm-hmm. I go, man, I'm always. As parents, as parents. Photos you, where I'm at, texting where I'm at. You feel like you got to, like, hide them from stuff. And it's like yeah. sometimes the, the kid could resent that part. 
where it's like you didn't tell me the truth. I feel like I should have knew the truth and everybody else should have got lied to. Yeah. That's yeah. almost guaranteed, especially the older the kid gets. Yeah, but I'm saying a lot of parents, resentment. sometimes you think going into it that you finna save the day and it's like, no, you actually doing the reverse. Mm-hmm. Like you making something build and, you know, this the podcast, this this us. <laughs> this this where we learned that, bro. You got to just sort of... Um, yeah, showing up. It's yeah. a showing up. And, you, and, and yeah, it's, yeah, time. Yeah, it's, it's right. more time than anything. Like, I mean, most men would be like, if I ain't got that job, mm-hmm. like, I don't want to be around my girl, make more. It's like, no, nah, literally just you being there. Yeah. Just being a dude. Yeah. So that everybody in the house see what a dude does. How does the dude sit? Yeah. How does a dude walk to the bathroom in the morning? Like, literally, it's just a, a walking example <laughs> for a <laughs> woman to see the habits of a dude and not tweak out about him. You know what I'm saying? And understand the dynamic of a man and a woman dealing with each other on a day to day or. Yeah not dealing with each other on a day-to-day in the same house, but in passing because they have a kid, like seeing that version of it, like that for them to, energy, yeah, right? for them to witness it. Yeah, you just learn to move different and we just, you know, on this show, we gonna encourage that shit. Yeah, it's like me watching my dad work. I mean, it's like, on one level, I'm like, well, I wish you would, you know, I could say, oh, he didn't take me to play basketball or anything mm-hmm. but it's like, he was showing up in a way, he, the only way he knew how to show up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I had learned a hell of a lot, right? So, I mean, showing up means different things. Real talk. Yeah, to, to different. But you get advantages. Yeah, man. There's disadvantages, but there's advantages. <laughs> uh, we like to ask all our guests, what are you working on improving in your personal life at the moment? I know you're working on fatherhood. But... Yeah. Um, wow, what am I working on personal life? Just, you know, owning my mind better. Yeah. You know? mm. Like, I'm meditating, oh. more, more sort of. More mm. consistently. I saw you sitting press leg on the other desk. <laughs> <laughs> figured, uh, like, figured, look at what I yeah. learned. Figured meditating yeah. was somewhere yeah, yeah, along yeah. the line. And, 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 and keeping my body strong. Yeah. You know, I, it's, I still want to, I want to, I want to like grind it out, you know, as long as I can, you know? Yeah. And so how do I just stay, you know, how do I keep my mind and my body as strong as I can for as long as I can? I love it. Like, uh, like you were just speaking to Sean, like I really, try you know i've been mindful like the last year year and a half to like make more time for things that i normally don't make time for Mm -hmm. so it's like even if you know my daughter's doing something i don't want to do like you need to make some time for that like you need if that means taking away from other things i need to do Mm -hmm. like then so be it like she can't wait forever or my son too like i just got him out here shout out to mike i just got him out here from uh chicago he's out here for a little bit and i you know, I try to really make time for him just because I don't see him often. And I know he feels that even though he yeah. doesn't like openly tell me how he's always feeling just because, he's, you know, he's guarded. He's a teenager, yeah. or whatever. I sound <laughs> but yeah, cool. yeah it's, it's like now. whatever. But, tough now, basing his voice. But, but yeah, right. But everything is like, you know, it's still like really, I don't like how I don't have that concentrated time. But at the same time, it's like I really have an urge now more, way more than I did in my 20s. And, you know, like I look back at it now, like I should have done more and I should have. So now I'm trying to kind of make up for all of that. Yeah. Mm. What, what about, about you? you? Yeah. Um, right now I'm, um, I'm doubling back for real. Uh, <clears throat> I think this time of my life is like for like <laughs> all the time that I was doing the stuff that like just saving money and, staying more over here to be focused and now it's like kind of letting the tentacles out so to speak Mm -hmm. it's like nah let me call my buddy that i know he was working at the the car thing and woo woo and let's let's do something like you know what i'm saying it's like yeah let's do the podcast i'm like trying to finish all the stuff that it was like it was a lot going on and then i pick up and go to the season and then we don't talk about it for a year or two right. years, and then I'm gone. I'm an athlete. And um, I think I'm kind of right now just trying to spin back and never – I don't like feeling like I lied to myself. Like, it's a lot of times you have these conversations with people, and I, I don't want to be a hypocrite in regards to, like, not doing stuff with people that you know you got love and obligation for. It's like some people are just part of the story, and it's like if we could do something – that make it to where we forever make money, you'll forever be my friend. Because yeah. I realize once the money stops between two people, like even some of my closest teammates, we got families over here. We got If you don't have no reason to make money together, after a while, we just run out. If we live in over here and over here, it's like this is the way we make as many bridges as we can so that I still run into all these people 
and everything that I need to happen is happening. We all making money. We all having a good time. It's a great work environment. All our kids know each other. Like, you got to make those bridges happen. Like, the world just don't get built. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm working on. Right cool. Now. Yeah, right up. You've ever Sean. He was like, cool. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. Hey, That's man. a good lesson, man. Just, uh, every okay. every show, uh, we get to tap in with the fans on social media mm-hmm. to answer some of their burning questions. Uh, Ari, what we got today? This burning question <laughs> comes from Twitter, and it's uh, from at RM Stasio, and they want to know, what are the qualities that make a good man? i say the only quality to make a man great is a, a man feeling like he can do anything. Um, if he don't got that quality, he's just not going to be a good man. I always took that from dad. I felt like dad's ability to do something on the spot or have the bravery to go do it and fail in front of your face and just be like, all right, but I just tried to do it. Like, y'all not even going to try. You know what I'm saying? And it was something about that that I felt like that's that's the only version of man I want to get down with. Like, I should be able to fix the flat, you know what I'm saying? Fix the chain on my bike. Uh, I should know how to do the change. Like the thing you said where you got to give somebody uh, a dollar over so you can get a $5 bill mm-hmm. back instead yeah, of saying, because you feel me? Like, doing, like I should know all these moves in advance. And if a girl or a younger brother or, uh, you know, somebody that don't know, if they're unaware, you're no longer ignorant when you're around me because right. I'm going to go through it for you. And now we all not ignorant to this situation. Like, I always felt like that was raw. So somebody that's, one, not fearful of the moment of having to step up to the plate and then having the humility to say, I kind of don't know how to do this but I'm still going to do it because we need it done. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a man. All right, Sean, what are the qualities mm-hmm. for you that make a great man? Uh, being unafraid to fail mm. and unafraid to be vulnerable. Mm. I Vulnerability guess that's it. means more yeah. than crying, too, guys. What it's else does it mean? Putting your shit on the line. When you say on the line, what you mean? Yeah. Um basketball game end of the game Kobe's got the ball eight seconds left you're talking about in life man no he's, he's translate metaphor, man. Bro. metaphor translate <laughs> Kobe Kobe top of the key eight seconds left who really wants to stand there that's a vulnerable place but if you get the stop the reward on the other side is as big as the disappointment to everybody else that's a vulnerable state to me it's the fight or flight feeling. He right. Vulnerable places, dog. That's where you need to be, all my young Those boys. Those were out the there. most extreme examples. <laughs> I don't know any men who do that outside of movies and video I like games. Blue so. collar guys. Sorry. Man. Oh, they're blue collar too. So this is like <laughs> trash men and fire fire workers and Hell all that. Yeah. They're the ones in your mind doing all this stuff. <laughs> Like, what's wrong with the man? You make me so though. like happy <laughs> and so bummed out. I don't have a brother. <laughs> this like, nigga want to be a spy. Up. You want to get a spy example? Did you guys share a room as a kid? Yes. I never had my own room. That's why I closed my door and locked my fucking door in hell. But we don't even live with you, so that's exactly. a problem internally. Like, <laughs> that's a problem internally. It's like, we're not even there to some piss shit him my off. wife got to deal with. <laughs> Inheriting the trauma, trauma. Real talk. Yeah. Inheriting right? The trauma. Inheriting the trauma, or just throwing it out exactly. for that. Well, it's yeah. your problem now. I don't have that problem. Yeah, I go. I sleep like a baby. Before no, we get <laughs> like a baby. Before we get out of here, we got we like to let you promote anything. There anything oh, yeah. besides cookies, milk, cookies and milk. Then we make sure we read it. <laughs> yeah, read the book or listen to the audio book, and um, and go to Spotify and listen to my music. Yeah, oh, man. Yeah. Or go wherever you, wherever, wherever you go to listen to music. Oh, I forgot uh, you got to say that now. What's the yeah. name of the album? Streaming on uh, all There's platforms. all sorts of albums there. Just the Reverend Show and Amos. Just the Reverend get online. Oh, Sean. yeah. Just Google if you're you. And then what do you... Uh, World Star. World Star for you, the Reverend Show and Amos. I don't even fan them. You know, they make you pay to get your video up there. I'm back to your video up there. Don't you do know they pay them. That's why they sit there don't like do that. Don't do World Star yeah. like, like that. I don't need man. this don't shit. I'll go back over there now. Real talk, He's going to take the books back when he leaves, too. So make sure you get Don't worry. You ain't going to be able to hear this now. But it'll be there in post. Thank you for coming on the show, bro. The reference. Sean Amos, thank you, man. The reference. Thank you.